Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. We, this is our second meetup and we are going to be looking at chapters six through 10 of part one of Fountainhead. We're going to start with uh, Rob Trusinski, followed by Maritza, Joya, and Sherry. All right, so let's go to Rob. Rob, floor is yours. Okay, I want to talk about a couple of things too. You know, I've, um, I've I'm Sherry's doing the background, historical background on, on architecture. I'm going to do some of the historical background on media and politics because, uh, you know, one of the interesting things people may not know, we got a little background on this, is that, um, when Ayn Rand came to America in 1926, she first came to Chicago because she had family in Chicago uh, and I think had an uncle or something like that who was in Chicago and her, her family, her uncle owned a movie theater. And which of course perfect because she had fallen in love with American movies in, uh, in Russia. And then to you know, have, be able basically to go to the movie theater and watch these American movies all day. And she stayed in Chicago for about a year, which I think is important because, you know, we were Sherry and I are bringing up a lot of his uh, uh, Chicago examples, and uh, you know it's it's the book is set in New even York. though she was fascinated with New York, the book was set in New York, but she spent a year in Chicago, and Chicago was also the epicenter for the birth of the skyscraper, Sullivan, Wright, a lot of the uh, Root and, and other people that Sherry's going to be talking about later. A lot of the architects that she is talking about or who is drawing from as historical examples were in Chicago. She was there and probably saw a number of, uh, almost certainly saw a number of these examples we'll be talking about. Uh, I also think, well, I'm going to get to this later when we start talking about Gail Winan, but uh, I think I'm going to draw a little bit on, uh, we'll be talking about the Tribune Tower a little bit today. Um, I'll be talking about Captain uh, Colonel McCormick, uh, the, uh, the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, who has certain, there's elements there and overtones of, of, of what Gail Winan ends up being. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the meet and oh, so that Ayn Rand, having been in Chicago, she then got a letter of introduction from her relatives to somebody out in Hollywood in the movie industry. She goes out to Hollywood, like first day she's there, she has a chance meeting with Cecil B. DeMille, uh, who, who gives like gives her a ride uh, and then gives her a pass to, to tour the studio and obviously he saw something interesting going on there. She ends up working as a scenario writer in the script writing department um, and uh, works in Hollywood for a bit. She eventually goes though to New York uh, after meeting Frank O'Connor and getting married, she goes to New York. And she, in New York, she works in the newspaper business with um, Isabel Patterson, who was the newspaper columnist at the time. So a lot of the stuff that goes on in New York with the media and the newspaper world that she's talking about, that was a world she knew from the early 1930s, being in this circle of writers and intellectuals and newspaper columnists uh, in New York City. So she, when she writes about what the newsroom is like at the banner, she's writing what she knows because she was she was there working there. And, and actually, what she says in the introduction, she says, you know, she uh, the, the, one of the few lines she stole in, uh, lines of dialogue in the book she stole from real life was uh, Frank O'Connor saying to her, you're casting pearls without even getting a pork chop in return. I think that has to do with the fact that she was working as an assistant for Isabel Patterson and providing all this great material for her and not really getting the pay or the reward that she should have been getting. All right, so all of this is sort of background for, you know, she didn't, she did a lot of research on the architecture but Hollywood and the movie, and uh, the ho Hollywood she knew something about from personal experience and the newspaper business in New York, especially, that's something she knew a lot about from personal experience. And that's sort of the background of this. I'm gonna get into that in a second. Before I get to that though, I'm gonna do something. Sherry was too modest to talk about this. So I'm gonna mention it that this is the first scene, the scene where Rourke, this section is where Rourke meets Mike, the welder. Mm -hmm. Is he a welder? He's the welder. He's a welder. She meets Mike the welder and they get on and he's, you know, he's like, oh, another of these architects doesn't know what he's doing. One of my and they end up scenes. really getting along. Well, this is something I've seen over and over again, because <laughs> this is Sherry's experience on the job site uh, when she has a project on. And uh, somebody asked her a while back, you know, do you have any, do you have problems with the fact that they don't want to listen to you because you're a woman? She says, and, and her general experience has been that they're much more prejudiced against her for being an architect. 
<laughs> the builders are yeah. yeah the builders are what is it bill said to you the first time you met him a builder just worked with him. um the first time i met him he sat on his tailgate and said i'm fine taking a look at your drawings and and building this house but and he sighs heavily and says it's just not all that often that i get a set of architecture plans that are actually buildable yeah to which point I tried to sit on the tailgate, but I'm far too short. <laughs> Bill's much taller. He's right? much taller than me. And so I just leaned against the tailgate, sighed, laughed, and said, I know what you mean. And we've been working together for, I don't know, 15 years now? Yeah, off and on, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've seen her go on the site and she'll be talking to the contractor and they're sort of looking at her a little scant. And then she starts talking about details or you know different kinds of bricks and shows breaking a brick joint yeah. basically shows with very quick order shows that she knows exactly what she's talking about she knows as much or more than they do and then they love her in fact uh, you found that the the fact that you're the fact that she's a, a woman it, it seems like it's even better you know she gets even more respect because she knows what she's doing so um I, i've seen this experience of of the the guys in the job site reacting to an architect who actually knows all the details and knows how to build. I uh, actually have a mic too. Oh, she has a mic I have too. a mic. And a little spoiler. <laughs> like I actually named Mike. His name is Mike. Um, a little spoiler for next week. Uh, there is a scene when Mike gets Howard Rourke a job. My mic has also offered me a position um, in a construction firm <laughs> to be construction, not construction physical, management. construction management. Um, where he actually said, you can name your price. Um, I didn't take it, but <laughs> so yeah, I have a mic. All right. So uh, I wanted to mention that because that's one of the fun things about to, for me about this is when I see that, I'm like, I recognize that I've seen that happen. All right. So I was talking about the, the background and, and the uh, uh, historical background. And so I want to talk a little bit, we're talking about the New York um, uh, uh, media background, we have to talk about Austin Heller. So it's the, one of the first encounters we have with this, that character who's going to continue throughout and be part of our, uh, our inside look at the newspaper business is Austin Heller. So let me read just a little bit about this. Um, he did not read much, Austin, much of Austin Heller, but he knew that Heller was the star columnist of the Chronicle, a brilliant independent newspaper, arch enemy of the wine, wine and publications that Heller came from an old distinguished family and had graduated from Oxford, that he had started as a literary critic and ended by becoming a quiet fiend devoted to the destruction of all forms of compulsion, private or public, in heaven or on earth, that he had been cursed by preachers, bankers, club women, and labor organizers, that he had better manners than the social elite whom he usually mocked, and a tougher constitution than the laborers whom he usually defended, that he could discuss the latest play on Broadway, medieval poetry, or international finance, that he never donated to charity, but spent most more of his own money than he could afford on defending political prisoners anywhere. And then the voice coming from the loudspeaker was dry, precise, with a faint trace of a British accent. And we must consider, Austin Heller was saying unemotionally, that since, unfortunately, we are forced to live together, the most important thing for us to remember is that the only way in which we can have any law at all is to have as little of it as possible. I see no ethical standard to which we measure the whole, uh, to which to measure the whole unethical conception of a state, except in the amount of time, of thought, of money, of effort and obedience, which a society exhorts, extorts from its every member. Its value and its, civil, its value and its civilization are an inverse relate ratio to that extortion. There is no conceivable law by which a man can be forced to work on any terms except those he chooses to set. There is no conceivable law to prevent him from setting them, just as there is none to force his employer to accept them. The freedom to agree or disagree is the foundation of our kind of society, and the freedom to strike is a part of it. I am mentioning this as a reminder to a certain Petronius from Hell's Kitchen, an exquisite bastard who has been rather noisy lately about telling us that this strike represents a destruction of law and order. All right, so it goes on there. Um, it, we don't really get more of Heller uh, because we go on to Tui. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about who the models for Heller are. And um, one of the uh, interesting characteristics, so one, uh, well, first of all, let me just, uh, look at yeah. 
one of the models for this, I'm gonna do a little screen sharing uh, just to show you, see if that works and let's play this, okay. So first person who I think is a potential model is H.L. Mencken and people are usually think, oh, Austin Heller is H.L. Mencken. And the reason they think that is because uh, Heller is known for being um, cursed by preachers, bankers, club women, and labor organizers. Uh, he has a reputation of a bit of, of being uh, sort of irreligious. Mencken was a well-known uh, atheist, basically, uh, 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 an opponent of, of organized religion, or a skeptic of organized religion, often very acid-tongued. The other parallel is that he began as a literary critic. Uh, Heller begins as a literary critic and becomes then a political writer. Uh, uh, Mencken had a similar sort of thing where he would, he did literary criticism and talked about art and also was and then also was a political commentator. However, and the other, but the main thing that makes people think of Mencken uh, is that Mencken had a reputation as sort of a misanthrope. Um, uh, so what he says here that since unfortunately we are forced to live together, that, that you know, it's how unfortunate it is that we are forced to live together. That is sort of a touch of Mencken to, to him. Um, you know, one of the things that I, uh, what do you do? I'm gonna uh, have a couple banking quotes that I wanted to pull out here, though I don't think I can do that without stopping stop my screen, and then screen. screen sharing. But I also wanted to show you just because I have one more photo. The other person who I think might be a model for uh, Heller, though, is this guy who is Henry Hazlitt. And you can see the the neatly dressed suit and you know the crisp sort of manner, a very intellectual appearance. This is Henry Hazlitt, who is actually a friend of Ayn Rand's, and I'm gonna get into that in a second. Uh, so I'll stop the share just so you can get a visual reference so on Henry House. picture to the black picture. Oh, yeah. So, we, that. so we've got the space. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And then I'm going to read you. Uh, why is my screen going blank? Right, go am I out of Zoom? Zoom? Okay. There, we are. there, I'm back to Zoom. Okay. Uh, I wanted to read you a couple quotes from Minkin. So some of them, some of these you may have heard of. Uh, my favorite is democracy is the theory that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, another one you may have heard is there's always a well-known solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. Uh, but here's one I wonder, a longer one I wanted to read because you can really see what she's pulling from here historically. And this is Mencken. All government in its essence is a conspiracy against the superior man. Its one permanent object is to oppress him and cripple him. If it be aristocratic an organization, then it seeks to protect the man who is superior only in law against the man who is superior in fact. If it be democratic, then it seeks to prevent to protect the man who is inferior in every way against both. Mm -hmm. One of its primary functions is to regiment men by force, to make them as much alike as possible and as dependent upon one another as possible, to search out and combat originality among them. All it can see in an original idea is potential change and hence an invasion of its prerogatives. The most dangerous man to any government is the man who is able to think things out for himself without regard to the prevailing superstitions and taboos. All right, so oh, where's Zoom again? Okay, so you can see in that quote, you know, clearly themes that Ayn Rand is pulling from. Uh, that's, he's clearly the model, model for Heller. Um, but I also want to talk about uh, about uh, Henry Hazlitt because uh, she and Hazlitt were friends. He introduced her to uh, one of the great free market economists, um, uh, Ludwig. Uh, no, not, I was about to, yeah, Ludwig. I was going to say Mies van der. No, <laughs> Ludwig Mies van der. Ludwig von Mises. We have Ludwig von Mises and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Sorry, I got a little confused. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Van der Rohe was the architect. Ludwig von Mises was the great Austrian economist, uh, free market economist, and Henry Hazlitt. And I even saw one reference, I have to track this down at some future point, but one reference to the fact that they were, she was friends with Hazlitt, I knew Hazlitt, uh, before she began the Fountainhead. So, and th that's totally plausible because they were both, you know, in the New York literary newspaper circles in the early 1930s. Uh, and they were friends for, you know, for a long time. Uh, and Hazlitt also has this thing where he was, a liter both a literary and artistic critic, and then wrote about politics. And he was a uh, an, an advocate of free markets and an advocate for for classical liberalism for uh, very for many decades. 
Um, and also interesting thing, I think I found out that uh, he initially wrote for The Nation, which was a left of center publication, until having differences with them and going on. So the idea that he'd be speaking at a pro-strike rally was is kind of ties into that. Um, now, the interesting thing, though, about both of those guys is they're different. They're still different from Heller in one other respect, which is neither Mencken nor um, Hazlitt actually completed college. Like they both went to college for like a semester and then for various reasons got pulled away or had to drop out and they were mostly self-educated. Whereas Heller is shown as having gone to Oxford and about how he is uh, speaks with a slight British accent and he's from a well-off family. So he's more aristocratic and more sort of formally educated than the, than the people she actually knew on whom she was basing some of this. Um, but it's interesting that there's sort of a type that occasionally appears in Ayn Rand's stories, especially early on. There's an unpublished uh, early so story or a scenario treatment that she did um, where the romantic oh. lead, it's one called Her Second Career. It's based on Hollywood, it's kind of a uh, satire on Hollywood in some ways. And one of the, the sort of the romantic lead in that one is a playwright who has come to Hollywood and he's seen as wearing you know, expensive tweed suits and having a slight British accent and being very intelligent. This is clearly a type that she was interested in and wanted to write into her stories, but not interested enough. Because one of the things I found interesting that made me think about is the contrast, you know, Heller is a bit of a contrast to Rourke. And so she had an interest in this kind of type of personality. But if you look at her heroes, at the men she really wanted to put at the center of things, and it's interesting when you consider here she is this Russian immigrant, her, her heroes and the, her ideal men that she portrays are basically you know, down to earth, blue collar Midwestern guys who are self-educated. <laughs> I find that very interesting that that's really, you know, she has a very clear type. If you look at John Galt, if you look at Howard Rourke, and if you look at her husband, Frank O'Connor, uh, well, Mike is the sort of the non-educated, non-intellectual <laughs> version yeah. of that. But her, her ideal man is the kind of man she actually married, which is, you know, Frank O'Connor, her husband was this down to earth Midwestern, guy who, uh, I don't know if he was Midwestern, but um, you know, down to earth, sort of regular middle American kind of guy who did blue collar work, but also had, you know, was, and, and then who was self-educated in, in most of her cases. Uh, and that's, I think, interesting, that's more her, her type for a hero. Now, the last thing I want to talk about today, though, is something that came up last time, but comes up much more to the forefront in when we start to meet Dominique. Now I've got a whole lot more to say about Dominique in a future thing when we get more of her story and, and more into exactly what's going on with her. Uh, but there's something that jumps out from this first meeting between um, Keating and Dominique Franken. Um, and I love this first exchange she has is your father should have warned you. And Keating says he did. She says, you should have listened. <laughs> and it's absolutely correct, of course. It's a disaster, you should have listened. Um, but uh, yeah, the thing I find interesting about her is when she says several times, um, he says, don't you, why does she, he asked her why she writes a column on architecture. He says, don't you like architecture? He says, I don't like anything in architecture. Well, you know, of course, that I won't believe that. Why do you write to have not, if you have nothing you want to say? She says, to have something to do, something more disgusting than many, uh, something more disgusting than many other things I could do and more amusing. She says, come on, that's not a good reason. She says, I never have any good reasons. Um, and then later on, when she talks about, um, let's see, I think it's the next page, uh, that Ralston Holcomb called her a nice little girl. He says, well, aren't you? What? A very nice little girl. No, not today. And then she goes on and talks about that. That fact that she has this sort of thing where she's, you know, I'm not a nice girl. I don't have any good reasons for what I'm doing. The interesting thing is that this ties into something that came up the last time I didn't have time to address, which is that uh, when Rourke has his meeting with the Dean, very early on in the book, Rourke has his meeting with the Dean uh, and the Dean reacts to something and says, that's monstrous. And he says, is it? Uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't say. He's, he's almost sort of like amoral about it. You know, it's like, it, I may be a monster and I don't really, you now part of what he's saying there is, I might be a monster by conventional standards, but I can't be bothered to figure that out because I don't care about conventional standards. 
but there is also something that comes up in, with her heroes here and it's elsewhere as well, that there's almost, I wouldn't say an immoralism, but that the question of is the hero good or bad um, is thrown into doubt in some way by statements like that. But I think it's not so, it's not so much, it's that she's not really concerned fundament. First of all, at the very beginning, she's not concerned with whether the heroes are good or bad. Her concern is metaphysical. So, you know, the character is a certain way, and that's the metaphysical nature of that character, to be independent-minded, to be uh, unconventional, to have a certain, you know, crackling intelligence, the way you see in, in Dominique in that first meeting. And that, that metaphysical, you know, the, the metaphysical judgment she's making is, this person is interesting, this person's extraordinary, and that comes before any question of, is this person good or bad? It's, so it's almost like, you know, on the literary and philosophical level, she's saying that the metaphysical nature of who this person is comes first and morality comes later. Moral considerations come later. But there's also something she's doing with those statements of, you know, I might be monstrous or I'm not a good little girl or I, I never have any good reasons for what I do, which is she says her goal is to portray the ideal man, which implies a kind of moral purpose. And she talks, as we, you know, we've talked about the, uh, the Magic Manifesto, she talks about art as a means of moral education, of conveying a moral ideal. And yet there are these times when uh, it seems like she's presenting her characters in this almost amoral way. Or, uh, but part of what's going on is that her ideal man, her moral ideal, is to be unconventional, to be totally independent thinker, to not be bound or... or um, not conform, not to be a conformist who follows the normal conventions of, of how you're, what you're supposed to think and how you're supposed to live and what opinions you're supposed to have. And so her way of showing that ideal of being unconventional is to have someone who is flying in the face of whatever the typical rules of polite behavior or uh, the, the, the ideas of polite society are, somebody who's going against that, flying in the face of it. Um, uh, and uh, it seems immoral on the surface, seems like a bad person on the surface because they're violating those conventional rules. But of course, she's then going to invert that and show us that, well, actually this person is the ideal and it's the conventional rules that are wrong. So that's sort of, there's, so sometimes you see this little ambiguity about is this, is Dominique a good person or not? Um, and, it's partly because the, the idea is that the ideal is to be unconventional, which means to be wrong by everybody else's standards. So she's setting up that paradox early on in the story. Uh, so that's the main thing I wanted to say. There's one other thing I wanted to add, which is uh, in that Heller quote I just read, uh, there is a reference to uh, Gail Winant as Petronius. Now, one of the things I love about the writing of this book is that Gail Wine is going to be a huge major character later on. He's got a whole section awesome. of the book named after him, three quarters of the way through. But he first, when he first gets worked in, in this first section of the book, he gets worked in so naturally as this sort of background character who's, you know, a little reference to him here, a little reference to him there, somebody saying something else about him over there, that you, you know, by the time you meet him, he's already this background character sort of woven into the fabric of the story. And all this characterization has been done on him before you even get to talking about who Gail Winand is. Uh, so I thought that was very artfully done on her part to weave him in in such a subtle way over a long period of time. But Heller refers to him as a Petronius. So this is um, some characterization we're getting early on. So who is Petronius? Mm. For those who don't know their Plutarch. Um, <laughs> Uh, Tacitus, Plutarch, and Pliny the El Elder all both had descriptions of Gaius Petronius Arbiter, uh, who was a Roman courtier in the era, in the in the in the under Emperor Nero. Nero, of course, being famously corrupt. Uh, and here's a description of him from Tacitus. He spent his days in sleep, his nights in attending to his official duties or in amusement. That by his dissolute life he had become as famous as other men by a life of energy. And that he was regarded as no ordinary profligate, but an accomplished voluptuary. His reckless freedom of speech, being regarded as frankness, procured him popularity. Yet during his provincial government, and later when he held the office of consul, he had shown vigor and capacity for affairs. After his returning to his life of vicious indulgence, he became one of the chosen circle of Nero's intimates, 
and was looked upon as an absolute authority on questions of taste. In connection with the uh, uh, questions of taste in connection with the science of luxurious living. All right, so that's that's a little bit of advanced publicity, advanced characterization that we're getting on Gail Winan. Uh, if you, for those who understand the a reference to uh, to to uh, Petronius. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I, I, I did not know about this Petronius and it's just so perfect. Thank you. Um, folks, uh, many oh, of the other thing I should mention, he's also reputed to be the author of a set of poems called the Satyricon, from which we get the word satirical. So again, satire being again part of uh, that kind of cynicism and satirical approach being part of Gail Winan's characterization. Wonderful. Uh, folks, uh, I want to remind you the format today is we, we've got four presentations. So now it's going to be Maritza, Joya, and Sherry. Uh, Rupali couldn't, can't make it uh, today. After which, we're going to take all the questions, okay? Any question that you have, and then we will go ahead and try to answer them. After which, if you would like to say anything about what you got from the sections, uh, from this section, you're welcome to share. So there will be three sections like this. Okay, but first the presentations put a lot of you know a lot of thoughts on the table. Please use pen and paper to keep track of all the questions, all the observations that you have. You have plenty of time to to put them forth. Maritza, hi. I just had to close my internet because I got a weird thing. Um, so what? What struck me in these, these chapters is um, I, I kept thinking about what we had spoken about um, in the previous session on the question of the self. And so I'm gonna focus a little bit on the, some of the characters spoken about in these chapters and the view of them from the perspective of the self, as it were. I wanna start with where um, Rob actually ended, well, right before he ended, the word nice. So I also wrote down two things from uh, the, this group of chapters regarding specifically that word nice. So I often say to people, so anyone who knows me has heard me say this before. And then, you know, I say, um, anyone who's nice all the time is a liar. They're either lying to themselves or they're lying to others because I truly don't believe that anyone can be nice all the time. And I've had spirited discussions with people on how they disagree with me vehemently. That's okay. I have, have not yet been won over. I hear their points and I still refute them. So my reasoning for this belief that I hold is that at our very core, we're emotional creatures, right? We're, we're humans. So we're, we have other emotions. So anyone who is always nice by the accepted definition of nice, you have to be lying. There's just no way around it. So, um, you know, Rob pointed out um, when uh, Dominique said that she was not nice, but there actually is a quote from um, when Rourke and Keating are speaking, when um, Rourke um, accepts the job with Keating, where they actually have the discussion, and I wrote it down here as a talking point, and it, it was fascinating to me because, um, Keating had decided he was gonna go and he had this whole thing in his mind how he was gonna to try to convince Rourke to go work for him with Francome. But um, Rourke took all of the, um, the fight out of him because he just accepted. And the reason he accepted was because he said, well, it doesn't matter where I go to work anymore. The one place I wanted to work is no longer available to me. So now anywhere will do was his thinking, right? And so, um, you know, but that wasn't, it didn't sit right with Peter. And it was, and what's fascinating here is that he says to him, can't you just be like a human being for once? And I'm paraphrasing, it's not, it's not the, the, you know, the direct um, quote of what he says, but, um, you know, he says, um, he's asking this of him, and um, Rourke is like, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, you know, human, simple, natural. And Rourke says, but I am. And he goes, but can't you ever relax? So Rourke kind of laughs at him and just relax all the way back in his chair. And um, Peter says, that's not what I mean. You know, he says, 
he's, he keeps questioning him and he says, do you always have to have a purpose? Do you always have to be so damn serious? Can't you ever do things without a reason, just like everybody else? You're so serious, so old. Everything's important with you. Everything's great, significant in some way, every minute, even when you keep still. Can't you ever be comfortable and unimportant? And, and work answers one word, no. So Keating is like, can't you, uh, don't you get tired of the heroic? And work's like, there's nothing heroic about me. What are you talking about? And Keating's like, nothing, everything. And, and what he tells him is, it's not what you do. It's what you make people feel around you. He says, what? The unnormal, the strain, when I'm with you, it's always like a choice between you and the rest of the world. I don't want that kind of choice. I don't want to be an outsider. I want to belong. There's so much in the world that's simple and pleasant. It's not all fighting and renunciation. It is with you. Work questions him. What have I renounced? Keating, oh, you'll never renounce anything. You'd walk over corpses to get, I mean, for what you want, but it's what you've renounced by never wanting it. Work's response, that's because you can't want both. Both what? Look, Peter, I never told you any of those things about me. What makes you see them? I've never asked you to make a choice between me and anything else. What makes you feel that there's a choice involved? What makes you uncomfortable when you feel that, since you're so sure I'm wrong? And, you know, P Peter says to him, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he asks, Howard, why do you hate me? And Howard is like, I don't hate you. Well, that's just it. Why don't you hate me at least? Why should I? Just to give me something. I know you can't like me. You can't like anybody. So it would be kinder to acknowledge people's existence by hating them. And work's response is I'm not kind, Peter. And to me, you know, so he doesn't use the word nice, he uses the word kind here, but I'm equating them, yes? So the, the significant there is I feel like that interplay, it's a very, very deep view into the psyche of the self and the two different, like diametrically opposed, opposed ways that it can present itself. And if we accept the premise that I presented to you last week, that let's assume that none of us is all one or all the other. Both of these facets live within us. Well, let's unpack that for a little bit. What does this mean? So the, the idea that if we go through life thinking that people should give us an acknowledgement of our existence, it leads to this angst because we walk through life with an expectation of somebody else's action. That just sounds exhausting even saying it because you're constantly, like you're demanding something of everyone you meet. Um, and it, that doesn't necessarily seem equitable. But the strange thing here is that it seems like Peter doesn't even realize that that's what he's doing. Like he's what he's saying to Vork in this interplay is that his view of himself is dependent upon the manner in which others respond or not even respond. It's, it's even almost uglier than that. It's the manner in which others present his self to himself. I don't know about you, but that's terrifying to me. And the, the weird thing about Keating is that he has these moments 
these insights where he's fully aware that he has this need, this constant need to allow others to shape him. If we fast forward to another conversation Keating had when he first met Dominique, it, they, they, you know, he orchestrated that her father would introduce them. And I love the, the way Rob pointed out their very first interaction. But I wanna point out to you their very last interaction. And in their last interactions, he, they're, they're going back and forth and he says a couple of gems, you know, that she keeps chatting with him. But the funny thing is that, well, first, before we get to their interaction, his very first viewing of Dominique, he got the chance to observe her. And we get, as readers, we get the chance to hear his inner thoughts in this observation. And because they're in his head, this we can assume is, you know, a, a real Peter Keating, as opposed to the Peter Keating we get for the most part, right? So, you know, he's, he's struck by her clothing and he thinks it's deliberately, um, like the words he used, I think actually is, uh, he says it deliberately opulent. And then he says, and yet still elegant. And he speaks about beauty, but it's funny because he uses the word art. And he says, when he viewed this beauty, he finally understood this word beauty as spoken of through artists. So we're painted a picture of Dominique Francone as this almost ethereal beauty. And then he, he sees her eyes. And, and that struck me because he's talking of the beauty, he's talking about how he finally understands arts and artists speaking of this beauty. And then he says, um, you know, she turned and looked at Keating as, as she passed him on her way to the stairs. Her eyes went past him without stopping. Something ebbed from his stunned admiration. He had had time to see her eyes. They seemed wary and a little contemptuous, but they left him with a sense of cold cruelty. So this is his first observation of her, Peter Keating at his honest. And yet, you know, the wheels in his mind of his manipulation are turning, so he still wants to orchestrate a, a meeting with her. And he does, and they chat back and forth. And, you know, here, you know, the, the not, not very uh, nice, a very nice little girl, right? When, when that comment comes up, she tells Keating, I'll tell you what I think of you because you'll be worrying about it. Like she sees him in a way that he doesn't see himself and she's spot on. But the funny thing is he sees something about her that's spot on in a way that's almost very unkeating like. And so she tells him, you know, she likes him. And she tells him that she's gonna tell father that she approves of him and all these glowing things she says of him. And he says, may I tell you only one thing that I think about you? She goes, certainly, any number of them. And he's, and this is Keating. He says to her, I think it would have been better if you hadn't told me that you liked me. Then I would have had a better chance of its being true. I find that clarity in this character to be astounding. And if we think again about the self, this matters to him. The reason that he can have this clarity, clarity is because every aspect of this personality is tuned towards the manner in which others view him. It's, it's no, he doesn't view it as a slander on himself specifically, unless somebody else tells him that it is. So that's why he's able to see that so clearly. And I think that's fascinating. And another thing, I really do enjoy the, when we get to hear Keating's observations, I find that they're the truest part of them. And so if we're looking at Keating and, and, and I find Keating to be almost the tragic, 
the he's the tragic um you know uh, character here in this in this book not necessarily because his life is a tragedy but i view him as tragic in every step of the way throughout this book we're shown the paths and the options he has and we see him making the choice and for him it's almost deliberate like he's choosing perpetually to follow the path of oblivion he wants to float and he's he told we heard him telling Rourke I don't want that choice I want people like me I don't want to be an outsider I want what's simple I want what's pleasant so he's deliberately choosing to cover his eyes so to me that's tragic you know because if you don't see a choice do you really have that choice but Keating sees the choices when he tells Dominique I wish you wouldn't have said that to me because I would have had a better chance of it's being true he understands that she's full of crap he does that she has almost you know no value she sees in him he understands that on some level so that's why to me I find him to be tragic so whenever and we're, we've already seen enough of Keating to know that whenever he's feeling flustered or upset or any kind of agitation, he goes to Katie. Katie is his soothing pool. You know, she's his Zen as it were. She's a Zen because she, she has no self. She's so deep. I mean, they're both in their own way. And I, I said this before and I'll stand by it again. I see that neither of them has a truly defined sense of self, but she is empty to the point of being refreshing for him because he has a sense of self that he actively spends all this time rejecting and subjugating. So when he's with her, he kind of like lets his hair down metaphorically. After meeting, not, not directly after, but after meeting with Dominique, he finds himself wanting to visit um, Katie and she's become ever more increasingly involved in her uncle's um, works. She's not home. And she, she, she left him a note inside the house, which is just foolish that she thought he would see it, but he still remembers that there's this big events gonna happen during the strike, a big speech. So he knows where to find her. And he's standing there and, and Rob spoke about, um, you know, um, Hunter uh, speaking right before Tui spoke. So I, I'm gonna point out for you a little observation that Keenan made when Tui took the, the stand, took the, he went to speak. He looks at, um, he, he looks at Katie while she's watching her uncle speak. And he's kind of scared, right? Because he thinks that, or like what he sees scares him. And the way in which he describes it is fascinating to me, again, because I find Keaton, he, he sees, he's making this choice. And be, so when, the, when he's speaking, this is Tui speaking, here's a little blurb about Keating's observation of Katie. Keating looked at Catherine. There was no Catherine. There was only a white face dissolving in the sounds of the loudspeaker. It was not that she heard her uncle. Keating could feel no jealousy of him. He wished he could. It was not affection. It was something cold and impersonal that left her empty, her will surrendered, and no human will holding hers, but a nameless thing in which she was being swallowed. Let's get out of here, he whispered. His voice was savage. He was afraid. She turned to him as if she were emerging from unconsciousness. He knew that she was trying to recognize him and everything he implied. She whispered, yes, let's get out. So as they're walking, he finds that their silence still scares him. And her will surrendered. She was empty. I mean, I cannot fathom ever listening to a speech 
with such intensity that someone would ever mistaking my look for one of emptiness and lacking in will. Um, but that's just me. But the, the fascinating thing here is twofold. A, that Keating sees this. He has this perception. He sees in other people what he considers to be the opposite of the simple and the pleasant. And that's what he wants, right? He wants to strive towards the simple, the pleasant. He sees this in other people and it frightens him. Um, with, um, it's different, it, you know, with Rourke, with Dominique, with Katie, it presents differently. But what, what I find is that it's the, the self he sees in others is clashing with the self he sees in himself. And what we're getting is his reactions to it. And if we consider for a moment the possibility that at some point we all experience these different selves, it's kind of a fascinating thought experiment. If you think about it, like what's the danger of blind faith? To me, it's arriving at that emptiness that he saw in Catherine. And again, this is, per this is a personal belief, but I do believe that one should not have a faith held so tightly and so completely that our very own will is extinguished. That's dangerous. It's dangerous to self. You know, I, um, just yesterday, and, and we, we were discussing um, flow states and the question of the self being good or bad came up. Now, I personally don't believe that it's either good or bad, but the interesting thing here is that what I do believe, and I think this is something that we're gonna see that Ayn Rand is clearly pointing out to us, without the self acknowledged, it's very difficult to find the, the path forward that will be most advantageous to us, as it were. Like, I'm not entirely sure how to state that, but I, I, what we see here in Keating, he's making the choice. He's deliberately seeing more than one path and he's choosing this path here. And we're gonna see how that plays out for him. Um, and spoilers, it's not gonna go well. But the, as we keep reading here, I'm gonna ask you guys to look at it from the perspective of what aspects of myself are highlighted here? And what is the cautionary tale being given? And how can we you know, acknowledge it and avoid it, right? Because, you know, the, Do Dominique is fascinating in that, you know, she says I, she does things for no reason, but she's so very tightly held together. She has a different fear than Keating's. She doesn't want to get attached to things. Keating wants everybody to love him. Dominique wants nobody to love her. She wants, she wants this separation. So it's, they're almost opposites. Um, we have to get a little bit more into the book to, to see that interplay more clearly. But um, so I, I have not gone into all the different characters, but I just wanted to point out those couple interactions here. And um, I'm probably gonna keep kind of, this is gonna be my focus. I think she can't, but the self, please. Thank you guys. Wow, Marisa, that was incredible. Now, I was not planning to say anything, but Rupali is not here. And you've said so many amazing things that I, I will all speak. Um, I think it is very simple. I think it's a question of axes. There is a vertical axis. Let's call that the I axis. So that means you in your core responding to existence as such. Okay, that's the I axis. And there is the horizontal plane on which there are lots of people around you. So it's imagine a circle and there is a vertical axis, okay? I think this is the entire story, okay? And I'll, I'll map everything in this. Actually this, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just com coming up with this right now, but um, I just want to give you an example. Like yesterday we had, we were discussing Bhagavad Gita and my friend Yogeshwar, 
he made an observation because Bhagavad Gita talks about that focus on the core of who you are. Don't get attached to a particular thing, particular sensory things. Okay. And Yogeshwar made a very interesting point. He says, though Bhagavad Gita mostly talks about sensory things in terms of senses, actually the way in which it happens with most people is that most people are worried about what other people think of them. That is the form in which you focus on the periphery. That is the most common psychological form in which you focus on the periphery and lose your sight of the center. Okay. Now, let's take the whole sequence that you talked about, you know, starting with Howard Rourke. Howard Rourke is just operating on the vertical axis. It's saying between him and existence, who am I? What is this existence? What I need to do? That's what he's focused on. Now, the entire operation of Peter Keating is in the horizontal plane. He just cares about what other people are thinking of them. Now, it is very interesting that he's actually able to see that there is a vertical axis. Most people who operate on the horizontal plane do not even know that there is a vertical axis. So they don't, don't even see what's going on. Okay. Now, all the statements that Peter Keating talks about, or the, you know, about how rock say, oh, you don't care about people. He, he, what he's saying is that you don't care about people who are, there is nothing on the word horizontal axis. But you look at Mike, okay, Howard Ross interaction with Mike. Mike has a genuine vertical thing going on. He's trying to build buildings. That is something between him and reality. And there, there is a tremendous, there is tremendous interaction goes, goes on between him and Howard Ross. I'm just, uh, in, I'm going to give you five examples in the increasing amount of intensity of interaction. So you have Mike, then you have Heller, then you have Mallory, then you have, uh, then you got um, Cameron, and then you got Wynan. The strength of that vertical axis is more and more across all these people and his interaction between them is more and more. I'm keeping Dominic aside for a moment because it is complicated, okay? Now, so, Peter Keating is interesting because he sees the vertical axis. Most people don't see the vertical axis. Now, let me jump to your last example of Tuhi. Tuhi is a master of orchestrating the horizontal. Okay, he can, he can just do dances around everything. And anybody who has a weak kind of vertical axis, he has the ability of making it go horizontal to destroy whatever is there, okay? So that's why he's, uh, Peter Keating has, is kind of like he's in an odd position. Now, let's try to integrate his interaction with Dominique and with Rourke. Okay, what is, see, see the commonality here. What, I mean, and because he's used to Rourke, he actually recognizes that it's, Dominique is like that. And she, he immediately sees that over time. Okay, that she, he knows that immediately, okay? Secondly, so he knows that when he hears Dominic praise him, he sees the whole thing going on. See, like Rohr could care less about the horizontal. Dominic understands the horizontal and despises it. So she's giving him all the horizontal values that he, he wants because he knows, she knows everything. He, in response to that, says, wait a minute, you are a vertical person. You are giving me all these horizontal values. Clearly, you're just giving me what I want to hear. And I would have had a better hope if you had said I dislike, because then you would have at least reacted. So what, what she did was that she just gave him, and, and she was pleased with it. So that she says, oh, wait a minute, you actually know what, that there is something like vertical. Okay, so that was the interaction between uh, like, between Peter Keating and this. But this is this kind of horizontal and uh, vertical, I, th I think to me kind of explains what's going on. Uh, thanks, thanks, Marisa. That's fantastic, fantastic observations. Thank you. Next up is Joya. Oh, 
Thank you, both Maritza and Srikant set me up perfectly because this is kind of exactly what I wanted to talk to, but getting at it from a slightly different angle because I want to talk today about characterization. Uh, but I wanted to focus exactly on this scene of Rourke and Keating and the one that even Marissa drew our attention to. Um, in the last session, Rob had pointed out to us that kind of where we are in the book right now is we're kind of seeing this parallel development of both Rourke and Keating. Last time we started out how they had graduated from college at the same time. They're both in New York. They're both now trying to progress on their careers. And the chapters that we've read today, we, we kind of see how this is happening. And we see how Keating in his own way is rising with the Franco, Franco architectural firm and Rourke is struggling and fighting, especially because Cameron was struggling and then had to give up his practice. And now, you know, Rourke is really trying to make his way as an architect. So that, that's where we are in the book. And I wanted to go even to that exact scene that Marissa had taken us to and really draw out. I think Irene is doing something just really wonderful here, literarily, and how she's giving us these characters. And I just even want to spend some time diving into that. But before I even wanted to start with a quote from Ayn Rand that came from um, originally a series of lectures she did about uh, the art of fiction, which was then turned into a book. And so this is just something that she said as part of this, this series of lectures about characterization. She says, I have seen young writers influenced by me make their hero a monotone. He speaks only in snappy yeses or noes, never shows anything but a tight grimness, and is always on the fighting premise. This is bad characterization. It is incomplete. The reader necessarily thinks a man cannot be this way all the time, nor can any man have only one premise. Good characterization is not a matter of giving a character a single attribute or making him monotonous. It is a matter of integrating his every particular aspect to the total, the focus of integration being his basic premises. For example, work is not only the man of integrity fighting everybody. He can be friendly and charming. He can be generous. He even has a few humorous lines, though I think only two in the whole novel. He has all sorts of facets, but he comes across as a monolith because every facet is consistent with his basic premises. So then I wanted to turn to, to the scene of, of work and Keating and see exactly what's going on here and how she draws this out. And what, what's fascinating to me is, so we do see work somewhat with these kind of monotones, I guess you could say, right? He's gonna give these very quick answers, but I wanna draw out how we see how that's consistent with his premises and who he is with his relationship to Keating. And then it's fascinating too, to me, how Keating is going to do most of the talking, but precisely what we're gonna see through Keating is his own lack of clarity. So, so Srikant was pointing out that, and I, that, that Keating is even better than the, you might say, typical second-hander um, in that Keating recognizes something important about work, like what Srikant is calling like the, the vertical axis. The Keating has a recognition of that on some level. Um, the way I like to think about it, Ayn Rand, when in her work on epistemology, always talked about the processes of differentiation and integration. And differentiation comes first, and, and it is important. And this is an example of you know, so many, many people can't even differentiate. And that is something that Keating can do and is doing well. He's differentiating work. He knows that work and Dominique, they have something, right? And many people don't even get to that level. Many people, you know, would not even see that. Um, but so Keating has something good that he's able to differentiate something about work, but he, he, he doesn't really have it clear yet. And we're going to see, I think, in this how Keating is struggle with, struggling with his own lack of clarity. So this is somewhat of a long scene, but I did just kind of want to read through it and, and kind of go, go through it here. So I'm going to start with Keating saying, Howard, let's go out and have a drink just sort of to celebrate the occasion. Sorry, Peter, that's not part of the job. Keating had come here prepared to exercise caution and tact to the limit of his ability. He had achieved a purpose he had not expected to achieve. He knew he should take no chances, say nothing else and leave. But something inexplicable beyond all practical considerations was pushing him on. He said unheedingly, can't you be human for once in your life? What? 
human, simple, natural, but I am. Can you ever relax? Work smiled because he was sitting on the windowsill, leaning sloppily against the wall, his long legs hanging loosely, the cigarette held without pressure between limp, limp fingers. That's not what I mean, said Keating. Why can't you go out for a drink with me? What for? Do you always have to have a purpose? Do you always have to be so damn serious? Can you ever do things without reason, just like everybody else? You're so serious, so old. Everything's important with you. Everything's great, significant in some way. Every minute, even when you keep still. Can't you ever be comfortable and unimportant? No. Don't you get tired of the heroic? What's heroic about me? Nothing. Everything. I don't know. It's not what you do. It's what you make people feel around you. What? The unnormal, the strain. When I'm with you, it's always like a choice between you and the rest of the world. I don't want that kind of choice. I don't want to be an outsider. I want to belong. There's so much in the world that's simple and pleasant. It's not all fighting and renunciation. It is with you. What have I ever renounced? Oh, you'll never renounce anything. You'd walk over corpses for what you want, but it's what you've renounced by never wanting it. That's because you can't want both. Both what? Look, Peter, I've never told you any of those things about me. What makes you see them? I've never asked you to make a choice between me and anything else. What makes you feel that there is a choice involved? What makes you uncomfortable when you feel that since you're so sure I'm wrong? I, I... I don't know. He added, I don't know what you're talking about. And then we're going to get to the part that, that Maritza, I think, already went through so beautifully about being kind. So I don't even feel the need to go through that part again. But I just even kind of wanted to go back and, and break up a little bit of what we've we've seen here and kind of what it's starting to tell us about the, the characters in, in this kind of almost indirect way. And I think just kind of getting at some of I, I think just Ayn Rand's brilliance in, in the characterization and how she's able to show us so much about Rourke and Keating in this very complicated way through, through this passage. So, so one of the, the things that, that strikes me here is that Keating is saying all of these things about Rourke, but he's clearly getting them wrong. So, you know, he starts by saying, you know, like, can't you be human for once? And like, Rourke doesn't even know what he's talking about. Clearly he is human. And he's like, he's saying you're human, simple, natural. And uh, let's see, Joya, you're having like, but I am a Joya and simple, and I am frozen. natural. A Joya, oh. you're having uh, internet issues. Mm. Uh, you, uh, um, how about yeah, just that, that's if it. I stop the video, is that better? It's 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 perfect. Uh, you you we could hear you up to uh, the point about human. Okay, right. So, um, so Keating was saying, you know, you, why can't you be human? And no, so work is clearly confused because obviously he is human and he sees himself as being simple and natural, but it's not to Keating. Keating is saying, can't you relax? But clearly work is relaxed. Um, so, so, you know, but Keating is, you know, getting at something here about work and then we're going to get we're going to get closer to what it is about work that Keating's trying to put his finger on. Um, he, Cause he's going to say then, you know, don't you always have to have a purpose? Why do you have to be serious? Can't, why can't you do things without reason? Everything's important with you. Everything is significant. And then he asked that question, can't you ever be comfortable and unimportant? And work says no, which I, I already thought was interesting that here, you know, work now is even finally recognizing that Keating finally has hit, something that work can't be comfortable and unimportant that for work things are important that's a huge part we see of what his character is about that he has this purpose he has this quest this goal to build buildings the way that he wants and this is serious and this is important and it is great and significant so here we, we we're starting to see that keating is getting onto something but then he's going to say like, you know, and Keating's going to identify this as being heroic, but work says, you know, what's heroic about me? Keating still, you know, doesn't even know himself what he's talking about because he's like nothing, everything. I don't know. It's not what you do. It's what you make people feel. And then, you know, Keating is seeing it as this, this kind of choice. And so this is now telling us about 
Keating's character now, even more than Rourke's character, that Keating sees that some kind of choice between what Keating views as being an outsider versus wanting to belong. You know, Keating says there's so much in the world that's simple and pleasant. It's not all fighting and renunciation. It is with you. But work is going to reject that. Work is going to say, what have I ever renounced? Work, you know, does see himself as simple and, you know, and finding things that are, are pleasant, even if he is fighting. Um, but he doesn't see it as renunciation. And then Keating kind of already starts to recognize this. Oh, you'll never renounce anything. Then Keating says, you'd walk over corpses for what you want. And again, I don't think that's an accurate reflection of work work is not the kind of person that's going to go out and kill people we're going to see like we we're going to find that that's crucial to Ayn Rand's own view of morality she's going to view people ultimately as traitors and you know not this you know it doesn't have to be you know one person having to sacrifice to another person so again this is Keating saying you know you'd walk over corpses but Keating is maybe getting at something about his own character because he's going to say but it's what you've renounced by never wanting it. And here, Warwick does recognize something because he says that's because you can't want both. And, you know, and Peter says, both what? And then, you know, Warwick is going to try to get Peter to get to some clarity. You know, he's going to point out, you know, I have never told you these things about me. What is it that you're seeing? Why do you see there's a choice? And why do you feel so uncomfortable when you're so sure that I'm wrong? And then it almost is left like a kind of cliffhanger here because Keating doesn't resolve it yet in this moment. But we see that we're we're building up towards something here. We're building up toward Keating having some kind of realization that in Keating's mind, he's seen you know, something between work and himself that he's not yet been able to resolve. And we're going to, you know, as the novel progresses, see the kind of realizations that he's going to make. I think um, Maritza and, and Sri Connor both right to point out that meeting Dominique and recognizing that Dominique is like a work and the interactions he's going to have with her are going to help him on this own path of, of clarification. But work too, I, I believe, is still at this point of trying to put into his own words exactly what it is that distinguishes himself from Peter Keating. We haven't yet heard work speak the words that are going to distinguish work from Keating, although perhaps work already has a, a better sense of it. But sometimes I think readers of this book even go wrong in reading it because they they read the scene and they almost read into the Peter Keating lines. They almost think like, oh, work is this guy who's just never going to go out and have a drink with anybody, even though we see just a couple pages later that that's not the case, that when work meets Mike, that they become friends. And that's exactly what they do. They go out and, and have a beer. So we find that it's not that, you know, work is, you know, not this person who is just all fighting and renunciation, who's not going to make friends and not want to go hang out and have a beer, that it's that work is going to be very particular about who his friends are and who he's going to want to spend time with and go out and have a beer with. And so then I even just wanted to end by going to that scene when when work hangs out with Mike and what we see here about the characterization of work through Mike, what it is that they have in common and why work does become friends with Mike. And so I just love this, this description of who Mike is. It says people meant very little to Mike, but their performance a great deal. He worshipped expertness of any kind. He loved his work passionately and had no tolerance for anything save for other single track devotions. He was a master in his own field, and he felt no sympathy except for mastery. His view of the world was simple. There were the able and there were the incompetent. He was not concerned with the latter. And I think we see that this is what work and Mike share. And, and I like to hear that this is there's a line here about single track devotions, which was a line that Ayn Rand applied to herself. It was, it was part of how she saw 
herself and her quest and her pursuit to write the novels that she wanted to write. And so just to, to see there that reflection of who Ayn Rand is and who Work is and who Mike is, and that this is part of the characterization we're going to see developing as the novel continues. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joya. Uh, thanks for bringing, uh, you know, reading that whole passage. Um, and the way I, I see it is that it's, again, I, mean, I see just the, again, uh, after you read it, I can see the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. What is happening is that Peter Kidding, all his words are on the horizontal axis. So he's saying, can't you be human? Human to him is somebody who is going, interacting with him, being influenced by him and, you know, and influencing him. And that's being their primary concern. That's to him is human. So the idea of the vertical axis doesn't. So though he kind of senses it intuitively, all his words, all, all the words here are all the concepts pertaining to the horizontal, only the horizontal. Whereas there is a human life along the vertical axis, which includes some horizontal, but that because that axis is missing, he's saying you have nothing on the horizontal. So it's like a platonic function. Another way of looking at it is form and function. The Peter Keating is all form. It is the social world has already been created. The goods are already here. These are the people around me. That's all I have. I have no capacity of producing anything on my own. All I have to do is to figure out how to interact with these people. These are all forms. The function that actually creates the social world is the vertical of an individual's capacity of saying, what is it? And trying to figure it out. And he has no conception of that. And when, whenever Howard Rourke is addressing him of saying, what do you mean I'm not human? What do you mean I'm not relaxed? What do you mean, uh, you know, all, all of those things. He's saying the life is function and it has form parts. So because he doesn't see the function at all in all those words, though he kind of intuitively says there is something here that Rourke has and Dominic has that is different. That much he's able to sense, but all his thinking, all his words he's using is all horizontal. And that's why there is a disagreement or all, all of that conversation is about the horizontal talking to the, the diagonal, if you will, which is both vertical and uh, horizontal. Uh, thank you. Next up is Sherry. Hi, everybody. Um, so I have a few different things. I'm going to have some pictures to share, um, some outside material here to read. Um, but as you, most of you already know, a little bit of my perspective on this is to sort of dissolve that idea that Howard Rourke is totally plucked from Frank Lloyd Wright and that Henry Cameron is totally plucked from Louis Sullivan and that things are just pulled so simply and so superficially, really. So I have a few things also to go into, um, into that on both the beginning here and the end of my little presentation today. So, um, and a little bit of some fun stuff in between. So to start with this idea of Henry, Henry Cameron being uh, taken as a, uh, from um, Louis Sullivan as a model. So we have this um, sad little detail here in chapter, very beginning of chapter seven, where we read, the bulletin of the Architects Guild of America carried in its miscellaneous department, a short item announcing Henry Cameron's retirement. Six lines summarized his achievement in architecture and misspelled the names of two of his best buildings. Now, this isn't the time when Henry Cameron dies and we're seeing an obituary, but I wanted to give you an example 
of um, because if if Henry Cameron is supposedly Louis Sullivan, then wouldn't we see the same thing? So I have here from, okay, so we don't have the American Guild of Architecture in America. We have the American Institute of Architects. So it's AIA. Um, when Louis Sullivan passed away in 1924, which is about the same time that um, Henry Cameron retires within a few years there, um, Louis Sullivan is, gets an obituary written, quite a beautiful obituary, and I will do my best to read it without getting choked up. But it is written by William Steele, who worked for Sullivan for three years. He was a prairie school architect, worked in the Midwest quite a bit. And what's interesting, first off, is that certainly the architectural world responded when Louis Sullivan died. But more interesting, I think, when reading this obituary is the potential of Ayn Rand perhaps having read this and listening to the words that are written and what they might have inspired. So this first paragraph, listen carefully and see who you hear. This is William Steele writing, and of course he's referencing himself, one of Louis, of Louis Sullivan's own students. He writes, always a hero worshiper, the writer of these halting lines has ever preferred to pay his tribute to genius by a reverent silence. Such a reticent, if I may call, if I may so call it, is too often due to a self-conscious fear of men whom we dimly recognize as bigger and wiser than we are. Too often also, our tongues make vocal our inferiority by fault finding and criticism that seem but the unconscious boastfulness of our lack of understanding. Then death calls the master and we begin to realize that there can be no requiem that will bring back to the world the unique spirit whose challenge fell dull, whose, whose challenge fell upon dull and timid hearts. Now, when I read this very introductory paragraph, I am struck at the very Keating-like line here, this self-conscious fear of men who we dimly recognize as bigger and wiser than we are. I find that really telling. So let me continue. Many find, and, and as I continue, listen to the inspiration this may have brought to Ayn Rand. Many and fine and true sayings are being uttered at the grave of Louis Sullivan. Yet no one so far seems to have given expression to the tremendous power which he possessed. He was a tireless man, a human force that needed but the opportunity to do. No problem staggered him. No task was too great. One of his nicknames among his draftsmen was the sun god. He charged at each new job with the perfect zest that we usually associate with youthful inexperience. He was a philosopher, but his philosophy never usurped his power of action and accomplishment. How he could draw. Miraculous things, never using an eraser, swiftly and surely swooping strokes from the elbow. Where are they now? Fortunate it is that thanks to the Institute Press, the last drawings he made are available to us. They are precious shadows of the tremendously powerful things he produced in the days when he had to teach the ABCs of his technique to his draftsmen, to the modelers of clay and to the carvers of wood and the cutters of stone. The autobiography of an idea, great human document though it is, only partly portrays the extraordinary dominant urge the man possessed. He seemed to have the fullness of power 
that exists in the mind of most men as a more or less dreamlike illusion. And so drawing ever unceasingly from his giant source of power, Louis Sullivan aspired greatly beyond the wildest contemporary dream of any student or teacher of the art that he loved. And to the last day he lived, he called out to youth. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to take it? Yeah, I Okay, it. Rob's going to take the rest here. Because she's a big marshmallow. Because I'm a big marshmallow. To True. the last day he lived, he called out to youth. A youth will someday hear his voice and understand his message and lead sophisticated age to a mountaintop where all may see that Louis Sullivan not only aspired, but splendidly accomplished. He was not merely a pathfinder. He not only broke a trail, but he also built a road. Finally, he gave up everything for the cause he loved. He never truckled. He sacrificed client after client to the imperious bidding of what he thought was right. He was insufferably overbearing at times, but he could not help it. Faith in what he possessed and wanted to share with his clients was so perfectly assumed that it became a passion. Nothing else was allowed to interfere with that supreme faith. And then at the last, with clients gone, friends gone, money gone, he did not recant. He retained his boyish optimism, mellowed and softened by the years. Bitterness visited him now and then, but never took lasting hold. Shortly before he died, he traveled to a school of architecture in response to the invitation of a man of vision, and he talked to the boys. They clustered about him like bees around an old apple tree. They listened enchanted, and they followed him to his train. I like to think of that quiet parting. There were no rah-rah outbursts, but moved by one of the inspirations which occasionally come to young men while their hearts are still tender. Every one of them stood with lifted hat while the great teacher was borne swiftly away from them. Let us now standing silently, let us now, let us now standing silently, join those boys in their spirit of reverence. So you can see here, there is, a tale of a hero that I like to think Ayn Rand might have noticed in some of her research when she was working on preparing for this book. Now, I also wanted to get into some little specific details. We'll tie back to when we were all talking about um, some, I guess it was last year, maybe this time last year, we were reading um, the Romantic Manifesto. And we're talking about art, painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, um, piece of music, how details matter, that every detail, Ayn Rand talks about how when you're creating something, every detail, there's nothing there to begin with. So every detail that you put in is extraordinarily important. And so that is part of the reason why great works of art always have that sense that you can go back over and over and over them and each time you get more information. Well, I've got a couple little tidbits of that in this novel, um, little details that mean so, so much, but they're just a little drop. So the first one I find personally deeply amusing um, because it is a personal pet peeve of mine um, in my career in architecture. Um, and it is this little line description from when Peter Keating has been working at Franken and Hayer for, Hayer for uh, three years. And he does a little spending. So it says here, he has an apartment off Park Avenue, modest but fashionable. And he bought three valuable etchings as well as one first edition of a classic he had never read nor opened since. So <laughs> this is a thing that I have an issue with, um, bookshelves that are not for books. <laughs> um, and so despite the fact, and we're gonna have to share a screen here, despite the fact that doing this is going to put me into some um, 
loop of some algorithm. I've done this before once and it caused me ha havoc for weeks. Because you get ads. I'm going to get ads about this. So in honor that none of you get these, I am going to show them to you in picture form. So speaking of books, you can all see this. This is, oh, you have to hit play. There we go. So I refer to this in our house as books for looks. So this is a this is a source catalog, Paragold, where you can purchase all manner of things to decorate your apartment. And one of the things you can buy for here it is $124, books by the foot. They are by color. And if you notice here, there are 58 color variations. So this particular one um, is all, you know, your greens, nice greens here. How do I turn this one? You could also do red, white, and blue if you were feeling particularly patriotic. Um, if you're really angling for spring, you can do daffodil. Um, and just so you know, these are all, these are not made. They, they are real books that somebody goes out and gathers and completely disregarding the what they are, what topic, what subject matter, none of that matters. It's the color of their spines. You could even get them ombre effect in berry tones. Um, you can, if you're particularly interested in the goth, you can do black with metallic red spines text. That's always an option. Um, but if that's not a pull away from the, the, the purpose of a book, you can even get them without any text at all. And if that having color and no text and no knowledge of what's inside the book isn't enough, you can even erase that too. Get it all the way down to color. So Srikant, I was thinking we should do this to your bookcase. <laughs> <laughs> So um, the other thing now, now for weeks, these ads for this book. Oh, they're going to be, gonna I'm going to pop up. I'm right. going to be getting yeah. so, people. They're going to be sending me ads. They think that I want these so badly. Um, I think we need to stop share for a second. We'll go to this black page and we'll stop share for a second. Another little detail. Another little over here. Yeah. Nope, right there. Nope. Right there. I got it. That's the one. Okay. So another little detail that I particularly like, notice that these little tiny kernels are so important. This one is on page 119. And it's a description of Dominique describing what she likes about Tui. She says, I admire him. He's so complete. You don't meet perfection often in this world one way or the other, do you? And he's just that, sheer perfection in his own way. Everyone else is so unfinished, broken up into so many different pieces that they don't fit together. But not Tui, he's a monolith. Now, what I find fascinating about this is she is referring, she is referring to Tui in the opposite way that Rourke refers to his buildings. When Rourke is describing a building, it has to be uh, integrated. One central idea, one core and everything reflects that. Dominique is finding the same thing. She doesn't care whether it's a good integration or a bad integration, just that it's a whole, that it's a monolith. And what this is foretelling to me, when I read this this time, it was like, oh, yes. This is a detail Ayn Rand is setting up for us, a foreshadowing. She is showing us that here are two characters who have this same desire for an integrated whole of something, but in a different way. So we are seeing Rourke with this love of this integrated whole in a building. And she has that same interest in a person. 
but she doesn't care whether it's good or bad. She just wants the whole. So that's something I want you to pay attention to as we go forward and read as we're detailing these interrelationships between these characters of how that perspective will change as we go through what causes what she sees in each one of it because she doesn't see this she comes right out and tells um, Peter Keating that that's not who he is but we'll see this play out as time goes on and then of course I'm giving the uh, the way the spoiler that that eventually becomes a conflict point in the novel so on the same sense of these buildings that we keep reading these descriptions. And one of the things that I really, really enjoy reading is that over and over, Peter comes to Howard Rourke for help and his floor plans. I find this so fascinating because Peter knows that there is something wrong with his floor plan, that there's parts missing, that there don't make sense that some, I mean, we get this description, this hilarious description that um, Dominique writes about the Ainsworth house with the uh, cast iron rump oh, <laughs> of mercury when you look out the window. I, uh, that one makes me, I don't, I, I can't, I, I know it's coming up every time I'm reading, I know it's coming. Still read the line makes me laugh out loud every single time. So I wanted to bring up some buildings and I made mention before about the building that takes parts of another, chunks of another building's soul. So I promised that I would bring that this time. Let's share screen, yeah, let's share um, screen. pull this up. And so the building I was referring to, let's not show the books again, okay? The building I was referring to was the Chicago Tribune Tower and um, this is one of those situations where it, it's, you can't help but say, this is, this is what Ayn Rand was thinking of to some extent for the Cosmos Latnik competition. This building had a worldwide competition, very similar. I'll get into greater detail about that when we get into that probably next week. But I wanted to show you, this is the building, the, the winning, design and the building as it stands today, it's cleaned recently. It used to be um, quite uh, dirty, but it's all along this base of the building where you see these chunks of another building. And now here's, here's an example of it. This one at the bottom is um, an ancient temple in China. Hunan, China, Hunan province, China. And then a little bit further up from there in the middle screen is a, a piece from Notre Dame. And above that is, um, can Fort you read that? Santiago, Manila. Okay. And then, or Fort Santiago. And then to give you a sense of how many, here is a few more, <laughs> just a few. I think there's quite a few. And they didn't stop, actually. They didn't stop once the building was built. If they could gather up another stone from another building, they would come and cut out a hole. They'd dig a hole and put a new one. This has continued literally up until the, the collapse of the World Trade Center towers. And they have a piece of the World Trade Center tower on part of the base of this building. So here's some of the examples. We have Pennsylvania Independent Hall. We've got part of St. Peter's from Rome. That, you know, you, you kind of feel like somebody went around, you know, uh, like You're going facing. to hotels, uh, just taking all the shampoo bottles and stuff. but. This was actually advertised. So this is an advertisement from 1924, um, not an advertisement, but an article about how the Tribune Tower was going to be doing this. And there's this long list. Um, that text is far too small for you to read, but I'll read a, a little bit of it here. One of the many interesting features of the Tribune Tower will be the permanent exhibition of stones from world famous buildings. These stones, which are now being gathered by correspondents of the, of the Chicago Tribune Foreign News Service are to be embedded in the wall of the main entrance of the tower and will be one of the most unique and unusual exhibits of the world. Already, 
according to Herb Kittle of the Office of the Building, 13 stones have been received. 12 of these are shown in the picture above. That's actually the picture down below, that little lower left-hand corner. And so they have here, like number two is the stone from Hamlet's castle in Helsingor, Denmark, and it's sent in by John Steele. Um, there is part of the Japanese lantern, that's number three from Tokyo. Uh, there's part from the Princeton University, uh, something from the old chapel at Yale, um, a stone from the Westminster Abbey in London, uh, something from Edinburgh Castle in Scotland, um, and one from the oldest part, the one stones from the oldest part of the building of the Cologne Dam in Germany. Um, so Notre Dame, they list that too. Um, this one is just a uh, delicious detail to me. Um, I love that she took this detail of real life and see how she threads it in. She doesn't talk about the Cosmos Latinic having these. She doesn't do anything so literal. What she does is she takes the sense of it, the core of what doing such a thing would mean. And she puts it into this one little line, completely separated from every other part. It's nothing to do with the Cosmos Latinic building. It's when Howard Rourke is talking to the Dean about what he sees as important in a building that it have a single idea. You would never borrow chunks of another human. You would never borrow chunks from another building. Um, and that's the way I think that Ayn Rand takes these details out in the world and out in the field of architecture and uses them in a much more detailed and rich way that really pays more attention to it's, it's, it's you get a lot of value to to dig deeper into them. Um, but here is another interesting detail I wanted to share. The Tribune Tower in Chicago is no longer a, a newspaper building. It has been sold probably because the Magnificent Mile property was far too expensive for a newspaper. Maybe it was the advent of the internet, I'm not sure, but it has been sold and converted into apartments. So, and I don't have a pointer, so I can't really point to this very top. Do you have a pointer? Can you guys see my, my, my pointer? Your cursor? My yeah. cursor? No, okay. So you see where these buttresses come all the way up and at the very, very, very top, you've got a floor and then balcony railings and then the sign of windows down below. That is an apartment, a two-story, one-bedroom apartment. Um, and I, I'm sure it's multi-million dollars. So you could choose to be in this Gothic tower, the multi-million dollar Quasimodo. And this is what you would get. This is the two floors. I'll pull up in a second, though, at a little closer context so you can see them. The one on the left here is the first floor of the apartment and the second on the right is the second floor. Um, you can see over our pictures are behind this, but this is a, let me see. So this is unit 2601. It's one bedroom, one bath, has a power room, has a library, a terrace, 3,155 square feet inside and a little over 500 square feet in terraces outside. Um, and of course, if you're in Chicago and you know where this is, you're right in the heart of the city, you're going to get fantastic views. But I cannot help but come in and take a look at this floor plan because I love to look at real estate and see their floor plans. But man, I would not want to live in this. I would love to live in this location, but not in this apartment in this current layout. So <laughs> let's take a little walk through it. So, and I don't have a pointer. So you guys will just look in the center where the elevators are and you enter from the uh, elevator, the elevator on the right into the foyer, which fine, you've got this nice big foyer. There's a terrace you can go to. And if you notice the terrace there to your lower right, will enter in out, by the way, outside 26 stories up in Chicago in the winter. Hmm. <laughs> You can go outside to your studio. 
So your studio over here on the lower right, it has its own bathroom. So this could be like a guest suite, but it's broken sure. up or an office. But notice it's broken up to this front doorway area that's this kind of funny shape. The bathroom's off there. It's a pretty good layout for the bathroom. You've got a closet for some storage, but all that square feet, you're, I mean, we're, you're 3,000 square feet. It's a multi-million dollar apartment and you've got a whole bunch of space that's just unused. And this little closed off studio, it's eight and a half feet by six and a half feet, which that might be the size of Shrikant's apartment. <laughs> But it's a pretty little space. If you were to fill that with bookshelves, you couldn't fit a desk in there. So let's go back to the foyer and then enter to the left into the living space. And you'll notice this odd situation that you've got just inside the entryway, um, this first terrace that you see, there's a staircase. Now you have this opportunity, this octagonal shaped structure you could have done any manner of different interesting things with the staircase, but they put it right across the terrace doors. So you have to go underneath this staircase in order to get to these terrace doors. Now, yeah, you do have one, two, three, four, five, six other terraces, but still, if you've got the terrace, you wanna be able to get to it. So this staircase, is just a bizarre use of space when you have so many other things. Why would you need to put that staircase maybe against the elevator core so that when you went up the stairs, you could look out upon the city? So when you get to the living room, now there's a nice big space, but you also have another elevator access directly into there. So there's not really, I'd want, I would probably put my furniture right smack in the center, but you've got 3000 square feet, you can have a pretty big party in this place. Now think about trying to do that in this kitchen. Again, yes, if you're in New York, this is a massive kitchen. In Chicago, apartments usually have a bigger kitchen than this. You've got a little bit of countertop space and it's just, I mean, it's like, I think we had more, a bigger kitchen in our first apartment. And let me tell you, it wasn't multi-million dollar apartment. Then when you go to the next floor, this is where it gets interesting. You go up this little staircase and you get to the master bedroom. So try, I know that some of you are trying to picture what it feels like in a, in a floor plan. It's really hard unless you're used to looking at floor plans to kind of sense what it will feel like to be in it. But you come up this staircase and you're coming from the left to the right. So imagine you're coming up that staircase and you're right in front of you is a wall of windows that's kind of cutting off and you're focused into this little point over here by the second stair. <laughs> and that's not a comfortable feeling. Then you have to kind of wind her back around and then you get to the master bedroom. And my question is where you can put the, where are you gonna put the bed? There's really only one wall. That's the one opposite the master bath. But then you're looking into this wall that hides your staircase instead of looking out one of these fabulous windows, like this one directly straight out on the far left. And then again, we talked about this with that other terrace. Look at this hallway space from the master bedroom that goes to the side of the master bath, across this one hallway to the closet, all that hallway. You're in a city you're spending an awful lot of money per square foot. Every single square foot needs to be a value. It doesn't need to be a hallway, especially if it's a master bedroom, right? You don't, you're, it's just you. It's not like there's other, it's not like the kids are down the hall or something. So when you're in this closet, take a look, there is a rack of clothes hung in front of one of these windows. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're, you know, your multi-million dollar Quasimodo, maybe you only need a small amount of clothing in there, but still that would be against the core section, like maybe that wall against where the, where the toilet is, but that whole other outside wall to the north side of this picture here, you couldn't, you, you can't use that because there's a window there. And then if you look, take what happens if you go into this library, 
where are your bookshelves going to go? Because they can't go against that top northern part because that's where your door is. There's really only one place, and that is this maybe six to eight foot section of wall down below, which maybe if your books are by the color, yeah. by the foot, so that it doesn't really matter. You books by the foot in there. It doesn't your matter. books by the foot. So this is the kind of thing that is very, very common. A lot but of architects- You also didn't mention that the entire master bathroom is entirely encased and closed. Yes, windows. so you no got windows. windows. Light at all. You got, you're way up 26 floors in Chicago. In this area, you're gonna get sunshine and light and views in every single direction. And you go into your bathroom and it's completely dark. There's not a window. Why wouldn't you open your master bath bathroom to one of these windows so that it flooded the bathroom full of light. And yeah, you'd probably wanna put up a curtain or your neighbors would see you. <laughs> but you know, there's kind of a thing in Chicago or in cities in general that, you know, you just kind of ignore your neighbors. You, know, you, you, pick, a, you pick a direction in which one of the yeah. windows in which there's nothing nearby and so you're, you're too far away to be seen. You're up so high, you're, you're higher than just about everything else there. So this is, Somebody got paid an awful lot of money to do that floor plan, which is a shame. And somebody paid several million, I believe. I don't, I haven't been able to find out what the selling price was for this unit. But anyway, so that is, um, that is what happens when you have architects who don't care about floor plans designing things. Um, then the one last thing I wanted to talk about was another spot where we have descriptions of, of buildings and plans. And this one, of course, I couldn't not talk about the Heller House. Um, so in this particular case, again, like I said before, is what, what, are, what was Ayn Rand using as her inspiration and how was she using it? Because she's always taking the part that makes the sense to move the novel, to, to better clarify the character or to move the conflict or the story forward. She doesn't just take it blindly and copy it. That's the kind of impression a lot of people give of what her, of what she's doing. So let's take a look at this. Uh, Sherry, can you stop sharing the screen? Yeah, well, I'm gonna share another picture oh, in a second. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, um, so because as I read the Heller House, I wanna show you this picture of, of course. Anybody want to say what they think the Heller House is? Come on, somebody. What do you think it is? Hit play. It's, it's blank, yeah. Yeah, but what do you think the Heller House is? If it were a, a real life example. What does it remind you of? No volunteers. Oh yeah, go okay. forward. So go forward, Rob. Falling water. Read so. Page. I picked this particular illustration because it's quite possibly um, the, the construction, the design and construction of, of Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright came about the exact same time that Ayn Rand was writing and researching the Fountainhead. So it, it would have been impossible for not to be aware of it. So what are the dates? This was designed 35? This was designed in 35. She was writing about that same time, but it wasn't built. Of course, when the design first came out, it probably wasn't advertised. It probably only got press once it was built or right before as it was being built. Um, so 38, 39. So we're not, I have to dig into the details to find out maybe reading the first draft versus the later drafts and find out exactly when this came in. There were similar buildings. And honestly, nothing really compares to falling water. So I'm going to read this description of the Heller House while you guys are looking at this particular design, because there's some very similar details of, of its design. But then there's some very different things. And I want to talk about that. So from page 124, the description of the Heller House um, in its drawings, of course, it hasn't been built yet. The house on the sketches had been designed not by Rourke, but by the cliff on which it stood. It was as if the cliff had grown and completed itself and proclaimed the purpose 
for which it had been waiting. The house was broken into many levels, following the ledges of rock, rising as it rose in gradual masses, in planes flowing together up into one consummate harmony. The walls of the same granite as the rock continued its vertical lines upward, the wide projecting terraces of concrete, silver as the sea, flowed the line, uh, followed the lines of the waves of the straight horizon. So this was really something that Frank Lloyd Wright chose to do. The Kaufman family, if you're not aware of the story, they had this site, they picnicked on this rock and watched the falls. And when they intended to have a design built, a design created for this site, they assumed or intended that it would give a view. The house would be down the hill and look at the falls. And it was Frank Lloyd Wright's design to put it on the falls for it to become part of the falls. And there is, if you haven't been to Falling Water, there's a place where you can go down the staircase that you see right above the water underneath this last terrace. You can go down that staircase and sit right above the water. So what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing was what Ayn Rand is describing that Rourke is doing, that, she, that Frank Lloyd Wright took the, the stones from a quarry that was disused just a few miles away. So it was literally the same rock, quarried the rock from the site and used that to make this massing that comes very much like the part of the cliff, the rocky face, ledge rock continuing further up. So it was a very much a, a purposely designed thing that Frank Lloyd Wright was doing. He was trying to create this, and it was in part of all of his designs that he wanted the house or structure to feel like it belonged of that place, not on that place, but of it. So that part is very much an ideal of what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing. Now, the concrete terraces, um, this, is, this is a new structural thing that they were able to do at that time. So it was kind of a, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright took it far to the end. Uh, personally, I, I, I have some quibbles. He, he, there's part of Frank Lloyd Wright that often um, he, he, thinks, he, he, he thinks so highly of his skill, rightfully so, that he forgets about some of the construction details. And I, I get extremely, as an architect, extremely frustrated with those details. Like you have a house without an outlet, so you can't vacuum the rug. <laughs> or in this particular case, these concrete terraces have, are completely horizontal. Now they should look completely horizontal, but they should have had a little bit of a slope so the water could pour off of them. Um, and that created all kinds of problems um, for the Kaufmans and for the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to this day, trying to deal with the fact that this is a place where it snows a lot. And <laughs> so there are parts of, Frank Lloyd Wright's designs that are highly personally irritating to me because he forgets part of the problem. Part of the project is to make sure the water gets off of the building and not stay on it. But anyway, that's a little sidebar. Um, I wanted to show you what's different about the Heller house and about falling water. And one of the clues here is in the description of the color. Go ahead forward, Rob. She talks here about the walls of the same granite of the rock. They continue vertical lines upward, projecting terraces of concrete silver as the sea. So this is nowhere near silver. <laughs> falling water has this, and this is, this is the classic photo of falling water this rich, warm hues, the stone 
is brown and tan, the terraces, the concrete was dyed this color. So it would be this warm, creamy color, which if you notice, it picks up this exact same color of the ledge stone. Rob wanted to put this picture in because of how much this ledge where the waterfall is uh, coming down. There's not a lot of flow in this particular picture. You can see how much these ledges, the thickness of them, the color of them, how they project is mimicked in Frank Lloyd Wright's terraces. But this one I liked because of its color. This is not the Heller House because the Heller House is blue and cold and it's on the sea, it's not on a waterfall. Um, this is another example of what I see as the ledge rock that is described in this description. Um, but what I like the most is this picture. This is a photograph of the Connecticut Rocky Seashore uh, by a photographer that um, likes to take his shots in black and white. And in this particular one, I get that sense of the rock being silver as the sea. Um, that's cold gray uh, projecting over this kind of a ledge. So you can kind of get a sense of the differences that you might see there. And that is my presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. Sherry, thank, thank you, especially for that uh, beautiful obituary. Uh, it, I couldn't read it all. I, my apologies. I have. I yes, have I would have had the difficulty to read it too. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. I want to make a special exception here. Uh, Iris, Iris, you wanted to talk about the topic of pain that goes only up to a point. Uh, folks, Iris um, has been a fan of Ayn Rand and has been reading Ayn Rand for many decades here in New York. And so I want to give her a chance to take, uh, Iris, you can take up to three to four minutes to talk okay. about this, go ahead. Okay, just quickly, I, I grew up in Chicago uh, at age 17 in 1957. I read The Fountainhead, I've read it many times. Uh, I was Ayn Rand's graphic designer, just a lot of things about me in objectivism. Um, I wanted to uh, mention uh, in the uh, taped or the uh, YouTube version, I, I guess it was Joya uh, was asking, had anyone else experienced pain that went only so far? Was that you? Yes, I think it was Joya. I, I, I was married for 54 years to an objectivist who I met at the romantic film series in Chicago, in uh, New York. Uh, and we had a wonderful life together. Uh, just many, many intersecting interests, ballet and direct marketing. Uh, and uh, when he died uh, in June, I, I felt terrible, but you know, we had spent our last days thanking each other for a wonderful life. I, and I, I, I love everything Rand has written, I, particularly in fiction, except for this idea of pain that goes only so far. I thought that even as fiction, it uh, wasn't human. And uh, uh, recently, uh, through the objective, uh, <laughs> the objective standard, they did uh, two parts on the fountainhead. And when they got to that, I thought, oh, you know, there's that part I don't like. And I was thinking about it after I saw it, and I realized I was living it. Uh, when I think of my life with my husband, I, I don't really feel tragic. The thing that comes to mind is all the wonderful things we share. Just, I, I was so far fortunate that we found each other and it was just the most beautiful relationship I can imagine. And uh, 
I didn't realize that I had done that. Uh, you know, at some point, you know, I may really feel the full weight of it, but you know, it's been what seven months or so, and uh, you know, I can only enjoy it and be so delighted that I had it. So uh, can I say a little bit about the Fountainhead? Please, please take, take your time, Iris. Please go ahead. I, I really loved all the presentations. I, it, it, because I haven't read it in a few years, I read it dozens of times. I, I was listening to it thinking of my 17 year old self. Uh, my parents had spent probably thousands of hours uh, talking and thinking about what they wanted out of life. They felt that you couldn't uh, know what you were doing, what you wanted, what you were thinking, unless it was put into words. And uh, what they came up with was what I refer to as a kind of walking around version of uh, objectivism. When I, again, in 57, 58, I gave my parents Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead, they both read it and said, oh, this is us. <laughs> and uh, they went to the objectivist lectures and the newsletters. And my brother and I both feel, he's five years younger, that we were raised objectivist. And listening to the quotes that you did from, both of you did, from uh, uh, the Fountainhead, you know, I heard them as I heard them when I was 17, which is, oh, someone else understands what it means to make your own choices, to see your life through your own eyes. It was just a great experience. So I have to go back and read it now. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Um, yeah. I would run into Iris and her husband at grocery store uh in our neighborhood because we lived in the same neighborhood in manhattan so uh iris thank you thank you so much thank you oh, uh, for about 10 years i moderated junto which mm -hmm. was a meeting of 80 to 120 people i uh, and uh, i did their newsletter which was full of you know interesting things in the world each month okay wonderful thank you thank you iris